The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, or the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And so here's the second version. I'm going to read it. It's from the message. God, my shepherd, I don't need anything. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And our second reading comes from John 10, 11 through 18. And uh, the significance of this reading, I think, for me anyway, is that it makes it clear that Jesus wasn't only there as a shepherd for the Jews, he was also there for everyone else, including us. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down for my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Let, let us all have a better understanding of his holy word. Thank you. What do you call a sheep that's covered in chocolate? A candy bar. (laughs) What do you get? This one is worse, so get ready. What do you get if you cross an angry sheep and a sulking cow? An animal that's in a bad mood. In Psalm 23, we're talking about shepherded sheep, and it paints this surreal picture of a time when you won't have any longing or wants because all your needs are met, and instead of the cold, snowy winters of the heart, you dwell in green pastures and beside still waters, and 
Our very souls are restored by it. And we know how to walk in the right paths. We know how to do the right thing. And even when we face our own death or the death of ones that we love, we're not afraid of any evil or harm because we have this sense of peace, you know, that things are going to be all right. And when we stand before our very enemies, we find a table of plenty prepared, a feast of peace and harmony. And our whole lives are anointed with the oil of promise and prosperity. That's what Psalm 23 is talking about. Our joy overflows and we live in goodness and mercy all the days of our lives. So what, what a beautiful picture of what life could be. And there are only two things it says we need to do to have that kind of life. And one is to acknowledge that God is our shepherd. And the second thing is we got to figure out how to be sheep. Can you say, bah? bah? Oh, you are so good. Wow, I might not even have to do the rest of the sermon. Uh, so what do we know about sheep? We know that they can recognize the shepherd's voice. They know who the shepherd is. And they've discovered that sheep are much more intelligent than we thought they were because they not only can recognize the faces of other <coughs> sheep for many years to come and remember them, but also human faces and human voices. So if they have someone who's cared for them and they don't see that person for a while, that some years later they'll still recognize the face and the voice of that person. And the passage in John that David read tells us that we need to be able to distinguish between the true shepherd and the hired hand. We need to know who to follow. And we've talked several different times about how we know the difference between a true leader and the one that leads us in the right direction and the one we shouldn't follow. And that is that the guidelines Jesus gave us. And they're the commandments that, what did Jesus say was the greatest commandment? You know that. Love God and Love your neighbor, yeah. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself, and that means enemies. And so the true shepherd, the one we need to follow, is the one that helps us to love and connect with our neighbors and our enemies and with each other, that helps us to be the best kind of people that we can be. And that doesn't mean a mamby pamby kind of love that gets walked over like a doormat. Sometimes it means a tough love that stands up to protect the powerless, that stands firm against oppression and evil. But the love is what distinguishes the shepherd from the ones that we don't want to follow. And the second thing that we can tell you about sheep is that the sheep are willing to follow the shepherd. And one of the things about sheep is that they were the very first domesticated animals in the history of humanity. So the reason that they were domesticated first is because they're genetically programmed to follow. Sheep are willing to follow. And so human beings realized that early on and began to raise the sheep as domesticated animals. And uh, so how are we in this day and time about following. Um, it seems like that there's this culture of I got to do it my way and I'm not going to do it anybody else's way and I'm going to do it on my own. Um, we love to order our medium tall rice, milk, vanilla, mocha, lattes, coffee, don't we? Because then it's different than anybody else's rice, milk, skim, vanilla, latte, tall coffees, and we know that we're different because uh, we can distinguish our particular preference from anybody else's. Like being a universe of one is the best thing. Um, it seems like we like to listen to our own voices and our own opinions and to shout it out loudly, even if there is somebody who's wiser or somebody else might have something to say that would give us greater wisdom, give us 
a little bit more to think about than just listening to our own thoughts or people who echo everything we think and believe. And I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians 12, Jesus doesn't say that one person is the leader or it's one person that we should follow, but it's the whole community of people that are the body of Christ following the head who is Jesus the Christ together. So what that scripture is saying is that, yes, we're given distinctive gifts and we need to be who we are and to celebrate that, but the whole purpose of the gifts isn't so we can go off in 1,200 different directions, but so we can be some kind of community and learn to follow together and be connected with love and grace and promise. So the second part of being a sheep bah, is to learn is being willing to follow, having the, the humility to follow. And we know that sheep are one of the few flock animals that don't have any defense against predators. You know, they don't have sharp hooves to kill them, and they don't have the horns, and they can't even run that fast. And so basically the only protection that sheep have is, is the shepherd. They know they're safe in the shepherd's hand. And what we're taught and believe that is that our ultimate safety isn't in what we own or who we know or what we know, but our ultimate safety is in our relationship with God. Our ultimate safety is in knowing the one who leads us and guides us and being willing to follow. And even when the path grows through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, that there's a certain kind of safety, even when we're in front of our enemies. There's a certain kind of safety that we have when we're following the shepherd and listening to the shepherd's voice. And the third thing that's good to know about sheep is that sheep are flock animals. They are gregarious. They like to be together. And everything they do stems from this trait of theirs. They congregate close <coughs> to each other. And if you isolate a sheep from the other sheep, it will become very stressed. And we human beings are like that too. Um, there have been a recent study that just came out that showed that loneliness is one of the most deadly things that we can experience in our lives, that loneliness adds to our mortality in higher numbers than any other of the lifestyle issues that we might be uh, participating in. Uh, drinking in excess or eating the wrong kind of foods or smoking or not getting exercise. Um, loneliness is worse for us than all of these things put together. And what that tells us is something we've known from the very beginning of time, that God created us to be in community and it's lodged even in our neurobiology that need to be in community and be together. So uh, in order to follow the shepherd, we need to figure out how to become a part of a flock. And that takes courage to go out and meet new people. And it takes even more courage to be tolerant, you know, of the flock's failures because a flock is made up of people and it's going to fail. You know, we human beings, we're going to fail sometimes. But being willing to try to be part of it. And also, you know, to go where the flock is going and not deciding to go our own way all the time, but just to have some tolerance for doing something a little bit different than is your number one preference. So, three things about being sheep we can remember. And the first <coughs> is learning how to distinguish the shepherd's voice, the true voice, and to be able to identify it as different from the one who isn't the shepherd. It means following the shepherd even though it may bring us through the valleys of the shadow of death. And the third thing, it means sacrificing our own wants and desires to be willing to follow, finding ways to be part of a flock, to be connected to each other, to share the joys and concerns in the midst of the chaos of life. There was a young <coughs> Belgian woman who lived in the middle of World War II who I think exemplified these characteristics. Her name was 
André de Jean. I don't speak French very well, but kind of figured out. That's kind of how you pronounce her name. And she was 24 years old when Germany invaded Belgium. And she saw the world just changing around her. Um, she was with her parents at that time, and she began to see things that she thought were wrong. She began to see Jewish people rounded up and put on cattle cars, and she heard that they were being sent to very harsh concentration camps or that they were being put to death along the way. She saw that anyone who disagreed with somebody who was doing all these things was put on the car with them and taken away or shot or severely punished in some way or another. And she kept quiet for as long as she could. And then she decided, you know what, I, I got to listen to a different voice than this voice of fear and then this voice that has us under its thumb. And so the ambassadors in the British consulate in Balboa, Spain were absolutely shocked when this young woman in August of 1941 walked in their doors, bedraggled and pale, and she was leading a British airman and two other Belgians, and she said, um, can you get him back to Britain, and can you help me uh, raise the funds to continue to bring other airmen over? And they're like, who are you? And uh, she told them who she was, and she said, I had to forge papers to get them on the trains from Paris to the border here. And then we walked over the Pyrenees Mountains. They walked over the treacherous Pyrenees Mountains. And she found a guide to help her do it. And she said, I want to do it again. And I want to do it again and again. And this 25-year-old woman, I mean, is anyone here 25? <laughs> Doc is, right. Mine is about, we won't say how many. This 25-year-old woman had the guts and like the insight to create this whole network of people who would rescue the allied airmen and bring them on this passage, which was called the Comet Line. The Comet Line. Uh, to safety um, in Spain. And she made more than 30 double crossings, going over and coming back and bringing more over and bringing them back. That's about all she did. Um, and she was finally captured uh, the 33rd time she tried to bring someone over. And she was sent to a concentration camp. But you know what? She had done her work so well that even after she was in the concentration camp, 700 more airmen continued to be able to be smuggled out of the war zone and back to safety. Isn't that incredible? Um, and she was eventually, in April of 1945, released from the concentration camp. Uh, but she was so ill and malnourished that it affected her health for the rest of her life. And she also had seen such a different way of life and a different way of being that she couldn't just return to the normal way of, you know, having a family and settling down in the suburbs and all of that. So she tended lepers in Africa. She went to Africa and for the rest of her days she tended lepers there. And um, what can we say about her? We can say, you know, in the words of the psalm, that she had the courage to lead people in the right paths, and that her soul was restored by it, and that even when she walked through the valley of the shadow of death and faced her own death over and over again, she wasn't afraid of the evil that she faced. She wasn't deterred by it. but she received the courage to continue, and she was comforted by the shepherd. And she moved back to Belgium in her retirement and lived in goodness and mercy all the days of her life, and she finally passed away in peace when she was 90 years old. 
and she dwells in the house of the Lord forever, don't you think? So, we're not in the middle of a war and we don't have to make those life and death decisions every day. But you know, in the little things, we're always challenged to be better people than we are. You know, in our personal relationships and the way we interact in the community and whatever we do at work and whatever vision we have of what we want the meaning and purpose of our life to be. So I invite you to uh, become a sheep and follow the good shepherd and be part of the flock and listen to the voice and live in goodness and mercy all the days of your life. Amen. There are several people we think of and pray for. We pray for Paul Marone, who is at Mass General Hospital. We think of and pray for Paul. Uh, prayers for my brother George's health, and that's from Sugatotis. Prayers for my relative who needs a kidney and a liver transplant, and that's from Sugatotis. Prayers for my cousin Tom Maroney who died this week. We pray for his uh, family and friends. And pray for Tom Forrest and family as their wife and mother died yesterday and my next door neighbor and friend. Um, blessings and peace upon their family and for their health issues. And that's from Ernie. Please pray for my cousin's family. Their daughter was killed in an automobile accident earlier this week. So we think of and pray for that situation. Um, prayers that God will provide new opportunities and that will God, God will give me the courage to take on those opportunities. Prayers for my health. I'm having a test at UMass to check for Addison's disease or a tumor and and my adrenal gland and prayers for the church for all they've done for me and the congregation. We are blessed. And that's from Cheryl LaCire. Um, prayers for the Hager family as Jenny transitions to hospice care. Uh, we wrap them up in love and prayers during this very difficult time. Please, uh, oh, yes. Joy reminds us that uh, after worship today, uh, there is a healing service. So um, if you want to stay for it, you're welcome to do that. Uh, after the postlude, we're going to start it right away in the front of the church. So as I said, if you want to come and participate, and you can come. Uh, please pray for Jane McGurk, who is confined for her home at home for two weeks with pneumonia. And you know Jane has had a number of health problems and uh, this pneumonia is very debilitating. So we think of and pray for Jane. Prayers for Ken Prue and family. He's returning home from Haywood Hospital um, and he's going on hospice today and that's from Katie Team. So we think of and pray for him. Uh, healing prayers for Wally Dupree. Um, she uh, she has an illness and she has a partial paralysis um, and as she heals from the illness she'll gradually get better um, but it will be some time before she is so we think of and pray for Wally. Uh, prayer for my sister Judy Rathburn who's in Athol Hospital after complications from passing a kidney stone so we think of it and pray for Judy and for the whole family. Prayers for uh, for Sam and for Jenny Hager, who's been put on hospice. Is that Cindy Hager? Cindy Hager, who's been put on hospice. We think of and pray for them. Uh, prayers for Lise and for her grandson, Lise Leal. So, uh, and we pray for Claudio, too. It's hard for him when Lise isn't here right beside him. Um, prayers for my mom, Rose, as she has her final orthopedic consultation about her leg tomorrow. And uh, prayers for Dan Richards. He fell on ice and broke his neck. And this is a dear friend of Doc's. And his friend is going to be out of work for some time. And 
Um, Doc is doing some fundraising to help his friend. So uh, raise your hand, Doc. Uh, so if you want to offer something to help uh, Dan, who will be out of work for some time, you're invited to do that. Um, we pray, too, for uh, Shirley Bach, who um, <coughs> is at home and having some health difficulties and who was in the hospital for uh, a time this past week. Yes. Oh, she went back, so she returned to Haywood. Correct. And I do not know anything of the <clears throat> Okay, we think of and pray for Shirley. She was in ER, she went home, and now she's back in Haywood. So we ask God's blessing upon her. Um, we pray for Sheila St. Laurent, who had surgery and is recovering at home, and ask for God's blessing upon her. And we continue our prayers for Mark Johnson, for Pat Spaulding, for Kay McGrone, um, for Shirley Kelly, for Joyce Sinclair, and for Bob Shepherdson and Ernie Boblin. Um, and just the situation in the world, I understand that there were 30 people killed in Afghanistan just recently, and it's, it's a tough world to be in these days. So let us bow our heads in prayer. Oh God, we want to believe you're our shepherd, and most days we do, and so give us the assurance that there's some guidance and leading that will help us to find the green pastures and still waters and restore our souls and help us to be a source of strength and inspiration to the people around us in all that we say and do so that we could serve you more fully. Help us to live in your love so that not only our lives are transformed, but we're able to transform the vitriol and hate around us into compassion and grace. Oh God, be with us so that even when we face the valley of the shadow of death, we're not afraid, that we don't have to be afraid because we can see with eyes beyond what our eyes can see into eternity and know that ultimately it's going to be all right. And may we be comforted by that sense of peace and help us to be able to have compassion for our enemies. Oh God, you know how hard that is when we've been hurt or when we fear that people that we love have been hurt. So help us all as a community, a nation, and a world to find ways to connect with the humanity of each other and to work out our differences and to live more peacefully. And we trust you, God. And we know that when we live and walk in you, that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives and will dwell in your house forever and ever. Amen.